The Black Feather by Mary Hartwell Catherwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Feather. Over a hundred voyageurs were sorting furs in the American Fur Company's yard under the supervision of the clerks, and though it was hard labor, lasting from five in the morning until sunset they thought lightly of it as fatigue duty after their eleven months of toil and privation in the wilderness fort mackinac was glittering white on the heights above them and half way up a paved ascent leading to the sally port sauntered tite le poise all the voyageurs saw her and strict as was the discipline of the yard they directly expected trouble the packing, however, went on with vigour. Every beaver, martin, mink, muskrat, raccoon, lynx, wildcat, fox, wolverine, otter, badger, or other skin had to be beaten, graded, counted, tallied in the company's book, put into press, and marked for shipment to John Jacob Astor in New York. As there were twelve grades of sable, and eight even of deer, the grading which fell to the clerks was no light task heads of brigades that had brought these furs from the wilderness stood by to challenge any mistake in the count it was the height of the fur season and mackinac island was the front of the world to the two or three thousand men gathered in for its brief summer axe strokes reverberated from bois blanc on the opposite side of the strait and passed echoes from island to island to the shutting down of the horizon choppers detailed to cut wood were getting boatloads ready for the leechers who had hulled corn to prepare for winter rations one pint of lied corn with from two to four ounces of tallow was the daily allowance of a voyageur and the endurance which this food gave him passes belief etienne saint martin grumbled at it when he came fresh from canada and pork eating mange du lard his companions called him especially charles charette who was the giant and the wearer of the black feather in his brigade of a dozen boats huge and innocent primitive man was charles charette he could sleep under snowdrifts like a baby carry double pats of furs pull oars all day without tiring and dance all night after hardships which caused some men to desire to lie down and die the summer before at nineteen years of age this light-haired light-hearted voyageur had been married to tite la boise their wedding festivities lasted the whole month of the mackinac season his was the wabosh and illinois river outfit almost the last to leave the island for the lake superior upper and lower mississippi lake of the woods and other outfits were obliged to seek indian hunting grounds at the earliest breath of autumn when the illinois brigade returned his wife who had stood weeping in the cheering crowd while his companions made islands ring with the boat song at departure refused to see him he went to the house of her aunt la boise where she lived mademoiselle la boise her half-breed cousin met him this educated young lady daughter of a french father and chippewa mother was dignified as a nun in her dress of blue broadcloth embroidered with porcupine quills she was always called mademoiselle la boise while the french girl was called merely tite because tite was married no one considered her name changed to madame charette to her husband himself she was tite la boise the most aggravating delicious unaccountable creature in the northwest she says she will not see you cher said mademoiselle la boise colour like sunset vermilion showing in the delicate aboriginal face what have i done gasped the voyageur mademoiselle lifted french shoulders with her father's gesture she did not know did i expect to be treated this way shouted the injured husband who can ever tell what tite will do next that was the truth no one could tell yet her flightiest moods were her most alluring moods 
if she had not been so pretty and so adroit at dodging whippings when a child tite la boise might not have set mackinac by the ears as often as she did but her husband could not comfort himself with this thought as he turned to the shop of madame her aunt who was also a trader it had surprised the indian widow who betrothed her own daughter to the commandant of the fort that her husband's niece would have nobody but that big voyageur charles charette though in those days of the young century a man might become anything for the west was before him an empire and woodcraft was better than learning madame la voise accepted her niece's husband with kindness her house was among the most hospitable in mackinac and she was chagrined at the reception the young man had met he sat down on her counter whirling his cap and caressing the black feather in it the gentle chippewa woman could see that his childish pride in this trophy was almost as great as his trouble what had teeth lacked he wanted to know had he not good credit at the stores tonnerre if madame would pardon him was not his entire year's wage at the girl's service had he spent money on himself except for tobacco and necessary buckskins madame knew a voyageur was allowed to carry scarce twenty pounds of baggage in the boats did tite want a better man let madame look at the black feather in his cap the crow did not fly that could furnish a quill he could not take from any man in his brigade charles threw out the arch of his beautiful torso and he loved her madame knew what tears he had shed what serenades he had played on his fiddle under tite's window and how he had outdanced her other partners he dropped his head on his breast and picked at the crow's feather the widow laboise pitied him but who could account for tite's whims when she heard the boats were in sight she was frantic with joy i myself asserted madame saw her clapping her hands when we could catch the song of the returning voyageurs it was then oh my shall my shall but scarce have the men leaped on the dock when off she goes and locks the door of her bedroom it is tite i can say no more what offended her i know of nothing you have been as good a husband as a voyageur could be and mackinac is so dull in winter she can amuse herself but little it was hard for her to wait your return now she will not look at you it is very silly what would madame laboise advise him to do madame would advise him to wait as if nothing had occurred the cure would admonish tite if she continued her sulking in the meantime he must content himself with tenting or lodging among his fellow voyageurs of the two or three thousand voyageurs and clerks one hundred lived in the agency house five hundred were accommodated in barracks but the majority found shelter in tents and in the houses of the villagers every night of the fur trading month there was a ball in mackinac given either by the householders or their guests and it often happened that a man spent in one month all he had earned by his year of tremendous and far-reaching toil but he had society and what was to him the cream of existence while it lasted he fitted himself out with new shirts and buckskins sashes caps nibs and moccasins and when he was not on duty showed himself like a hero knife in sheath a weather-browned and sinewy figure to dance sing drink and play the violin and have the scant dozen white women the half-breeds and squaws of mackinac admire him was a voyageur's heaven its brief duration being its charm for he was a born woodsman and loved his life charles charette did not care where he lodged neither had he any heart to dance until he looked through the door of the house where festivities began that season and saw tite la boise footing it with etienne saint martin parbleu with etienne saint martin the squab little lardy to whose brother alexis saint martin 
had been put into doctor's books on account of having his stomach partly shot away and a valve forming over the rent so that his digestion could be watched it was disgusting teat would not speak to her own husband but she would come out before all mackinac and dance with any other voyageurs who crowded about her charles sprang into the house himself and without looking at his wife hilariously led other women to the best places and danced with every sinuous and graceful curve of his body teat did not look at him from the corner of his eye he noted how perfect she was the fiend and how well she had dressed herself on his money all the brigades knew his trouble by that time and an easy breath was drawn by his entertainers when he left the house with knife still sheathed in the wilderness the will of a brigade commander was law but when the voyageur was out of the fur company's yard in mackinac his own will was law one of the cautious clerks suggested that charles and etienne be separated in their work since it was likely the husband might quarrel with tite laboise's dancing partner turn em in together man chuckled the scotch agent robert stuart who had charge of the outside work let em fight man gurdon i have na had any sport with these wild lads since the boats came in but the combatants he hoped to see worked steadily until afternoon without coming to the grip they had no brute anglo-saxon antagonism and being occupied with different bales did not face each other the triple row of indian lodges basked on the incurved beach where a thousand indians had gathered to celebrate that vivid month night and day the thump of their drums and the monotonous chants of their dances could be heard above the rush and whisper of blue water breaking on pebbles lake michigan was a deep sapphire colour and from where she stood below the sally port tite la boise could see the mainland's rim of beach and slopes of forest near and distinct in transparent light and she could hear the farthest shaking of echoes from island to island like a throb of some sublime wind instrument the whitewashed blockhouse at the west angle of the fort shone a marble turret there was a low meadow between the fur company's yard and pine heights though no salt tang came in the wind it blew sweet refreshing the men at their dog-day labour and all the spell of that island which since it rose from the water it has held lay around them etienne st martin picked up a beaver skin and in the sight of tite la boise her husband laid hold of it release that mange du lard he said eh bien responded etienne knowing that he was challenged and the eyes of the whole yard were on him this fine crow he claims all mackinac because he carries a black feather in his cap there are black feathers in other brigades but you never wore one in any brigade they dropped the skin and faced each other feeling the fastenings of their belts old robert stuart slipped up a window in the office and grinned slyly out at the men surging towards that side of the yard he would not usually permit a breach of discipline but the winter had been so long myself i have no need of black feathers etienne gave an insolent cast of the eye to the height where tite la boise stood charles magnificent of inches scorned his less developed antagonist hey man gurdon softly called old robert stuart from his window set them to it will ye the lads will be jawing till the morn's morn this equivocal order had little effect on the ordained course of a voyageur's quarrel these saint martins without stomachs how is a man to hit them poof said charles and etienne felt on his tender spot the cruel allusion to his brother alexis whose stomach had been made public property he began to shed tears of wrath i will take your scalp for that as for the black feather i trample it under my foot let me see you trample it and my head is not so easily scalped as your brother's stomach all the time they were dancing around each other in graceful and menacing feints but now they clinched and charles charette when the struggle had lasted two or three minutes 
took his antagonist like a puppy and flung him revolving to the ground he hitched his belt and glanced up towards the sally port as he stood back laughing etienne was on foot with a tiger's bound he had no chance with the wearer of the black feather as everybody in the yard knew and usually a beaten antagonist was ready to shake hands after a few trials of strength but he seized one of the knives used in opening packs and struck at the victor's side as soon as he had struck and the bloody knife came back in his hand he crouched and rolled his eyes around in apology no man was afraid of shedding blood in those days but he felt he had gone too far that his quarrel was not sufficiently grounded he heard a woman's scream and the sharp checking exclamation of his master and felt himself seized on each side there was much confusion in his mind and in the yard but he knew tite la boise flew through the gate and passed him and he tried to propitiate her by a look pig she projected at him like a missile and he sat down on the ground between the guards who were trying to hold him up and wept copiously i didn't want to have trouble with that charles charette and that tite la boise explained etienne and i don't want any black feather on account of my brother's stomach i have to fight if they do not let my brother's stomach alone i will have to kill the whole brigade but charles charette walked into the fur company's building feeling nothing but disdain for the puny stock of saint martin as he held out his arm and let the blood drip from the little wound that stained his calico shirt-sleeve the very neeps around his ankles seemed to tingle with desire to kick poor etienne it was not necessary to send for the surgeon of the fort robert stuart dressed the wound salving it with the rebukes which he knew discipline demanded and making them as strong as his own enjoyment had been he promised to break the head of every voyageur in the yard with a board if another quarrel occurred and he pretended not to see the culprit's trembling wife that little besom whose caprices had set the men by the ears ever since she was old enough to know the figures of a dance yet for whom he and mrs stuart had a warm corner in their hearts she had caused the first fracas of the season moreover he went out and slammed the office door ordering the men away from it bring me yon etienne saint martin commanded mr stuart preparing his arsenal of strong language i'll have a word with yon carl for this the noise of the one-sided conflict could be heard in the office but teat remained as if she heard nothing with her head and arms on the desk her husband took up the cap with the black feather which he had thrown off in the presence of his superior he rested it against his side his elbow pointing a triangle and waited aggressively for her to speak the back of her pretty neck and fine tendrils of curly hair ruffled above it were very moving but his heart swelled indignantly tite la boise why did you shut the door in my face when i came back to you after a year's absence she answered faintly me i don't know and dance with etienne saint martin until i am obliged to whip him me i don't know yes you know you have concealments he accused and she made no defence this is the case you run to the dock to see the boats come in you are joyful until you watch me step ashore i look for teat her back is disappearing at the corner of the street eh bien i say she would rather meet me in the house i fly to the house my wife refuses to see me teat made no answer what have i done charles spread his hands my commandant has no complaint to make of me it is charles charette who leads on the trail or breaks a road where there is none and carries the heaviest pack of furs and pulls men out of water when they are drowning it is charles charette who can best endure fasting when the rations run low and can hunt and bring in meat when other voyageurs lie exhausted about the camp-fire i am no little lard eater from canada brother to a man with a stomach having no lid look at that charles shook the decorated cap at her i wear the black feather of my brigade that means that i am the best man in it his wife reared her head she was like the wild sweet briar roses which crowded alluvial strips of the island fragrant and pink and bristling 
yes monsieur that black feather regard it me i am sick of that black feather you say i have concealments i have all winter i go lonely the ice is massed on the lake the snow is so deep the wind is keener than a knife i weep for my husband away in the wilderness believing he thinks of me eh bien he comes back to mackinac it is as you say i fly to meet him my breath chokes me but my husband what does he do she looked him up and down with wrathful eyes he does not see teat he sees nothing but that black feather in his cap that he must take off and show to monsieur ramsay crooks and monsieur stuart while his wife suffocates charles shrunk from his height and his mouth opened like a fish's but i thought you would be proud of it me what do i care how many men you have thrown down you do not like me any better because you have thrown down all the men in your brigade she is jealous jealous of a feather humbled as he was by her tongue the young voyageur felt delighted at giving his wife so trivial a rival he settled his belt and approached her and bowed madame permit me to offer you this black quill which i have won for your sake and which i boasted of to my masters that they might know you have not thrown yourself away on the poorest creature in mackinac destroy it madame it was only the poor token of my love for you graceful and polite as all the voyageurs were charles charette was the prince of them with his big sweet presence as he bent Tite flew at him and flung her arms around his neck after the manner of latin peoples they instantly shed tears upon each other and the black feather was crushed between their breasts End of the Black Feather by Mary Hartwell Catherwood The Celestial Omnibus by E. M. Forster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski The Celestial Omnibus by E. M. Forster one the boy who resided at agathox lodge twenty eight buckingham park road surbiton had often been puzzled by the old signpost that stood almost opposite he asked his mother about it and she replied that it was a joke and not a very nice one which had been made many years back by some naughty young men and that the police ought to remove it for there were two strange things about this signpost firstly it pointed up a blank alley and secondly it had painted on it in faded characters the words to heaven what kind of young men were they he asked i think your father told me that one of them wrote verses and was expelled from the university and came to grief in other ways still it was a long time ago you must ask your father about it he will say the same as i do that it was put up as a joke so it doesn't mean anything at all she sent him upstairs to put on his best things for the bonzes were coming to tea and he was to hand the cake stand it struck him as he wrenched on his tightening trousers that he might do worse than ask mr bonds about the signpost his father though very kind always laughed at him shrieked with laughter whenever he or any other child asked a question or spoke but mr bonds was serious as well as kind he had a beautiful house and lent one books he was a churchwarden and a candidate for the county council he had donated to the free library enormously he presided over the literary society and had members of parliament to stop with him in short he was probably the wisest person alive yet even mr bonds could only say that the signpost was a joke the joke of a person named shelley of course cried the mother i told you so dear that was the name had you ever heard of shelley asked mr bonds no said the boy and hung his head but is there no shelley in the house why yes exclaimed the lady in much agitation 
Dear Mr. Bonds, we aren't such Philistines as that. Two at the least. One a wedding present, and the other smaller print in one of the spare rooms. I believe we have seven Shelleys, said Mr. Bonds, with a slow smile. Then he brushed the cake crumbs off his stomach and, together with his daughter, rose to go. The boy, obeying a wink from his mother, saw them all the way to the garden gate, and when they had gone he did not at once return to the house, but gazed for a little up and down Buckingham Park Road. His parents lived at the right end of it. After number 39 the quality of the houses dropped very suddenly, and 64 had not even a separate servant's entrance. But at the present moment the whole road looked rather pretty, for the sun had just set in splendor, and the inequalities of rent were drowned in a saffron afterglow. Small birds twittered, and the breadwinner's train shrieked musically down through the cutting, that wonderful cutting which has drawn to itself the whole beauty out of Surbiton, and clad itself, like any alpine valley, with the glory of the fir and the silver birch and the primrose. It was this cutting that had first stirred desires within the boy, desires for something just a little different, he knew not what, desires that would return whenever things were sunlit, as they were this evening, running up and down inside him, up and down, up and down, till he would feel quite unusual all over, and as likely as not would want to cry. This evening he was even sillier, for he slipped across the road towards the signpost, and began to run up the blank alley. The alley runs between high walls, the walls of the gardens of Ivanhoe and Bella Vista, respectively. It smells a little all the way, and is scarcely twenty yards long, including the turn at the end, so not unnaturally the boy soon came to a standstill. "'I'd like to kick that, Shelley,' he exclaimed, and glanced idly at a piece of paper which was pasted on the wall." rather an odd piece of paper, and he read it carefully before he turned back. This is what he read. S and CRCC. Alteration in service. Owing to lack of patronage, the company are regretfully compelled to suspend the hourly service and to retain only the sunrise and sunset omnibuses, which will run as usual. It is to be hoped that the public will patronize an arrangement which is intended for their convenience. As an extra inducement, the company will, for the first time, now issue return tickets, available one day only, which may be obtained of the driver. Passengers are again reminded that no tickets are issued at the other end, and that no complaints in this connection will receive consideration from the company nor will the company be responsible for any negligence or stupidity on the part of passengers, nor for hailstorms, lightning, loss of tickets, nor for any act of God. For the direction. Now he had never seen this notice before, nor could he imagine where the omnibus went to. S, of course, was for Surbiton, and RCC meant Road Car Company. But what was the meaning of the other C? Coombe and Maiden, perhaps, of possibly City. Yet it could not hope to compete with the Southwestern. The whole thing, the boy reflected, was run on a hopelessly unbusinesslike lines. Why no tickets from the other end? And what an hour to start! Then he realized that unless the notice was a hoax, an omnibus must have been starting just as he was wishing the Boneses goodbye. He peered at the ground, through the gathering dusk, and there he saw what might or might not be the marks of wheels. Yet nothing had come out of the alley, and he had never seen an omnibus at any time in the Buckingham Park Road. No, it must be a hoax, like the signposts, like the fairy tales, like the dreams upon which he would wake suddenly in the night, and with a sigh he stepped from the alley right into the arms of his father. Oh, how his father laughed! Poor, poor Popsy, he cried. Didums, didums, didums think he'd walky pocky up to Evink? And his mother, also convulsed with laughter, appeared on the steps of Agathox Lodge. 
don't, Bob, she gasped. Don't be so naughty or you'll kill me. I'll leave the boy alone. But all that evening the joke was kept up. The father implored to be taken too. Was it a very tiring walk? Need one wipe one's shoes on the doormat? And the boy went to bed feeling faint and sore and thankful for only one thing that he had not said a word about the omnibus. It was a hoax, yet through his dreams it grew more and more real, and the streets of Surbiton, through which he saw it driving, seemed instead to become hoaxes and shadows. And very early in the morning he woke with a cry, for he had had a glimpse of its destination. He struck a match, and its light fell not only on his watch, but also on his calendar, so that he knew it to be half-hour to sunrise. It was pitch dark, for the fog had come down from London in the night, and all Surbiton was wrapped in its embraces. Yet he sprang out and dressed himself, for he was determined to settle once and for all which was real, the omnibus or the streets. "'I shall be a fool one way or the other,' he thought, "'until I know.' Soon he was shivering in the road under the gas lamp that guarded the entrance to the alley. To enter the alley itself required some courage. Not only was it horribly dark, but he now realized that it was an impossible terminus for an omnibus. If it had not been for a policeman whom he heard approaching through the fog, he would never have made the attempt. The next moment he had made the attempt and failed. Nothing. Nothing but a blank alley and a very silly boy gaping at its dirty floor. It was a hoax. I'll tell Papa and Mama, he decided, I deserve it. I deserve that they should know. I am too silly to be alive, and he went back to the gate of Agathox Lodge. There he remembered that his watch was fast. The sun had not risen. It would not rise for two minutes. Give the bus every chance, he thought cynically, and returned to the alley but the omnibus was there. Two. It had two horses, whose sides were still smoking from their journey, and its two great lamps shone through the fog against the alley's walls, changing their cobwebs and moss into tissues of fairyland. The driver was huddled up in a cape. He faced the blank wall, and how he had managed to drive in so neatly and so silently was one of the many things that the boy never discovered, nor could he imagine how ever he would drive out. Please, his voice quavered through the foul brown air, please, is that an omnibus? Omnibus est, said the driver, without turning around. There was a moment's silence. The policeman passed, coughing, by the entrance of the alley. The boy crouched in the shadow, for he did not want to be found out. He was pretty sure, too, that it was a pirate. Nothing else, he reasoned, would go from such odd places and at such odd hours. About when do you start, he tried to sound nonchalant. At sunrise. How far do you go? The whole way. And can I have a return ticket, which will bring me all the way back? You can. Do you know? I half think I'll come. The driver made no answer. The sun must have risen, for he unhitched the brake, and scarcely had the boy jumped in before the omnibus was off. How? Did it turn? There was no room. Did it go forward? There was a blank wall. Yet it was moving, moving at a stately pace through the fog, which had turned from brown to yellow. The thought of warm bed and warmer breakfast made the boy feel faint. He wished he had not come. His parents would not have approved. He would have gone back to them if the weather had not made it impossible. The solitude was terrible. He was the only passenger, and the omnibus, though well built, was cold and somewhat musty. He drew his coat round him, and in so doing chanced to feel his pocket. It was empty. He had forgotten his purse. "'Stop!' he shouted. "'Stop!' And then, being of a polite disposition, he glanced up at the painted notice-board, so that he might call the driver by name. "'Mr. Brown, stop! Oh, do please stop!' Mr. Brown did not stop, but he opened a little window and looked in at the boy, 
His face was a surprise. So kind it was, and modest. "'Mr. Brown, I've left my purse behind. I've not got a penny. I can't pay for the ticket. Will you take my watch, please? I am in the most awful hole.' "'Tickets on this line,' said the driver, "'whether single or return, can be purchased by coinage from no terrene mint. And a chronometer, though it had solaced the vigils of Charlemagne, or measured the slumbers of Laura, can acquire by no mutation the double cake that charms the fangless cerberus of heaven. So saying, he handed in the necessary ticket, and while the boy said, Thank you, continued, Titular pretensions, I know it well, are vanity. Yet they merit no censure when uttered on a laughing lip, and in an homonymous world are in some sort useful since they do serve to distinguish one jack from his fellow. Remember me, therefore, as Sir Thomas Brown. Are you a sir? Oh, sorry. He had heard of these gentlemen drivers. It is good of you about the ticket, but if you go on at this rate, however does your bus pay? It does not pay. It was not intended to pay. Many are the faults of my equipage. It is compounded too curiously of foreign woods. Its cushions tickle erudition rather than promote repose. And my horses are nourished not on the evergreen pastures of the moment, but on the dried bents and clovers of Latinity. But that it pays, that error at all events, was never intended and never attained. Sorry again, said the boy rather hopelessly. Sir Thomas looked sad, fearing that, even for a moment, he had been the cause of sadness. He invited the boy to come up and sit beside him on the box, and together they journeyed on through the fog, which was now changing from yellow to white. There were no houses by the road, so it must be either Putney Heath or Wimbledon Common. "'Have you been a driver always?' "'I was a physician once.' "'But why did you stop? Weren't you good?' As a healer of bodies I had scant success, and several score of my patients preceded me, but as a healer of the spirit I have succeeded beyond my hopes and my deserts. For though my drafts were not better nor subtler than those of other men, yet by reason of the cunning goblets wherein I offered them, the queasy soul was oft times tempted to sip and be refreshed. The queasy soul, he murmured, if the sun sets with trees in front of it, and you suddenly come strange all over, is that a queasy soul? Have you felt that? Why, yes. After a pause, he told the boy a little, a very little about the journey's end. But they did not chatter much, for the boy, when he liked a person, would as soon sit silent in his company as speak and this he discovered was also the mind of Sir Thomas Brown, and of many others with whom he was to be acquainted. He heard, however, about the young man Shelley, who was now quite a famous person, with a carriage of his own, and about some of the other drivers who are in the service of the company. Meanwhile the light grew stronger, though the fog did not disperse. It was now more like mist than fog, and times would travel quickly across them, as if it was part of a cloud. They had been ascending, too, in a most puzzling way. For over two hours the horses had been pulling against the collar. And even if it were Richmond Hill, they ought to have been at the top long ago. Perhaps it was Epsom, or even the North Downs. Yet the air seemed keener than that which blows on either. And as to the name of their destination, Sir Thomas Brown was silent. Crash! Thunder by Jove, said the boy, and not so far off either. Listen to the echoes. It's more like mountains. He thought, not very vividly, of his father and mother. He saw them sitting down to sausages and listening to the storm. He saw his own empty place. Then there would be questions, alarms theories, jokes, consolations. They would expect him back at lunch. 
To lunch he would not come, nor to tea. But he would be in for dinner, and so his day's truancy would be over. If he had had his purse, he would have bought them presents. Not that he should have known what to get them. Crash! The peal and the lightning came together. The cloud quivered as if it were alive, and torn streamers of mist rushed past. "'Are you afraid?' asked Sir Thomas Brown. "'What is there to be afraid of? Is it much farther?' The horses of the omnibus stopped just as a ball of fire burst up and exploded with a ringing noise that was deafening but clear, like the noise of a blacksmith's forge. All the cloud was shattered. "'Oh, listen, Sir Thomas Brown. No, I mean, look. We shall get a view at last. No, I mean, listen. That sounds like a rainbow.' The noise had died into the faintest murmur, beneath which another murmur grew, spreading stealthily, steadily, in a curve that widened but did not vary. And in widening curves a rainbow was spreading from the horse's feet into the dissolving mists. "'But how beautiful! What colors! Where will it stop? It is more like the rainbows you can tread on, more like dreams!' The color and the sound grew together. The rainbow spanned an enormous gulf. Clouds rushed under it, and were pierced by it. And still it grew, reaching forward, conquering the darkness until it touched something that seemed more solid than a cloud. The boy stood up. "'What is that out there?' he called. "'What does it rest on, out at that other end?' In the morning sunshine a precipice shone forth beyond the gulf. A precipice. Or was it a castle? The horses moved. They set their feet upon the rainbow. Oh, look! the boy shouted. Oh, listen! Those caves! Or are they gateways? Oh, look between the cliffs at those ledges! I see people! I see trees! Look also below, whispered Sir Thomas. Neglect not the diviner Acheron. The boy looked below, past the flames of the rainbow that licked against their wheels. The gulf also had cleared, and in its depths there flowed an everlasting river. One sunbeam entered and struck a green pool, and as they passed over, he saw three maidens rise to the surface of the pool, singing and playing with something that glistened like a ring. You! down in the water he called they answered you up on the bridge there was a burst of music you up on the bridge good luck to you truth in the depth truth on the height you down in the water what are you doing sir thomas brown replied they sport in the mancipiary possession of their gold and the omnibus arrived Three. The boy was in disgrace. He sat locked up in the nursery of Agathox Lodge, learning poetry for a punishment. His father had said, My boy, I can pardon anything but untruthfulness, and had caned him, saying at each stroke, There is no omnibus, no driver, no bridge, no mountain. You are a truant, gutter snipe, a liar. His father could be very stern at times. His mother had begged him to say he was sorry, but he could not say that. It was the greatest day of his life, in spite of the caning and the poetry at the end of it. He had returned punctually at sunset, driven not by Sir Thomas Brown, but by a maiden lady who was full of quiet fun. They had talked of omnibuses and also of Baruch Landau's, how far away her gentle voice seemed now. Yet it was scarcely three hours since he had left her up the alley. His mother called through the door, Dear, you are to come down and to bring your poetry with you. He came down and found that Mr. Bonds was in the smoking room with his father. It had been a dinner party. Here is the great traveler, said his father grimly. Here is the young gentleman who drives in an omnibus over rainbows, while young ladies sing to him. Pleased with his wit, he laughed. 
"'After all,' said Mr. Bonds, smiling, "'there is something a little like it in Wagner. "'It is odd how, in quite illiterate minds, "'you will find glimmers of artistic truth. "'The case interests me. "'Let me plead for the culprit. "'We have all romanced in our time, haven't we?' "'Hear how kind Mr. Bonds is,' said his mother, while his father said, "'Very well. Let him say his poem, and that will do. "'He is going away to my sister on Tuesday, and she will cure him of his alley-slopering. <laughs> "'Say your poem.' "'The boy began. "'Standing aloof in giant ignorance,' his father laughed again, roared. "'One for you, my son.' standing aloof in giant ignorance i never knew those poets talked sense just describes you here bonds you go in for poetry put him through it will you while i fetch up the whiskey yes give me the keats said mr bonds let him say his keats to me so for a few moments the wise man and the ignorant boy were left alone in the smoking-room Standing aloof in giant ignorance, of thee I dream, and of the Cyclades, as one who sits ashore and longs perchance to visit. Quite right, to visit what? To visit dolphin coral in deep seas, said the boy, and burst into tears. Come, come, why do you cry? Because, because all these words that only rhymed before, now that I've come back, they're me. Mr. Bonds laid the Keats down. The case was more interesting than he had expected. You? he exclaimed. This sonnet? You? Yes, and look further on. I, on the shores of darkness, there is light, and precipices show untrodden green. It is so, sir. All these things are true. I never doubted it, said Mr. Bonds, with closed eyes. You? Then you believe me? You believe in the omnibus and the driver and the storm and that return ticket I got for nothing and... Tut, tut, no more of your yarns, my boy. I meant that I never doubted the essential truth of poetry. Some day, when you read more, you will understand what I mean. But, Mr. Bonds, it is so. There is light upon the shores of darkness. I have seen it coming. Light and a wind. Nonsense, said Mr. Bonds. If I had stopped, they tempted me. They told me to give up my ticket, for you cannot come back if you lose your ticket. They called from the river for it, and indeed I was tempted, for I have never been so happy as among those precipices. But I thought of my mother and father, and that I must fetch them. Yet they will not come, though the road starts opposite our house. It has all happened as the people up there warned me, and Mr. Bonds has disbelieved me like everyone else. I have been caned. I shall never see that mountain again. "'What's that about me?' said Mr. Bonds, sitting up in his chair very suddenly. "'I told them about you, and how clever you were, and how many books you had, and they said, Mr. Bonds will certainly disbelieve you.' "'Stuff and nonsense, my young friend. You grow impertinent. I, well, I will settle the matter. Not a word to your father. I will cure you. Tomorrow evening I will myself call here to take you for a walk, and at sunset we will go up this alley opposite and hunt for your omnibus, you silly little boy.' His face grew serious, for the boy was not disconcerted, but leapt about the room singing— "'Joy! Joy! I told them you would believe me. "'We will drive together over the rainbow. "'I told them that you would come. "'After all, could there be anything in the story? "'Wagner, Keats, Shelley, Sir Thomas Brown? "'Certainly the case was interesting. "'And on the morrow evening, though it was pouring with rain, "'Mr. Bonds did not omit to call at Agathox Lodge.' The boy was ready, bubbling with excitement and skipping about in a way that rather vexed the president of the Literary Society. They took a turn down Buckingham Park Road, and then, having seen that no one was watching them, slipped up the alley. Naturally enough, for the sun was setting, they ran straight against the omnibus. "'Good heavens!' exclaimed Mr. Bonds. "'Good gracious heavens!' 
It was not the omnibus in which the boy had driven first, nor yet that in which he had returned. There were three horses, black, gray, and white, the gray being the finest. The driver who turned around at the mention of goodness and of heaven was a sallow man with terrifying jaws and sunken eyes. Mr. Bonds, on seeing him, gave a cry, as of recognition, and began to tremble violently. The boy jumped in. "'Is it possible?' cried Mr. Bonds. "'Is the impossible possible? Sir, come in, sir. It is such a fine omnibus. Oh, here is his name. Dan someone.' Mr. Bond sprang into. A blast of wind immediately slammed the omnibus door, and the shock jerked down the, all the omnibus blinds, which were very weak on their springs. "'Dan, show me. Good gracious heavens, we're moving. Hooray!' said the boy. Mr. Bonds became flustered. He had not intended to be kidnapped. He could not find the door handle nor push up the blinds. The omnibus was quite dark, and by the time he had struck a match, night had come on outside also. They were moving rapidly. "'A strange, a memorable adventure,' he said, surveying the interior of the omnibus, which was large, roomy, and constructed with extreme regularity, every part exactly answering to every other part. Over the door, the handle of which was outside, was written, La siate ogni, baldanza voa che entrate. At least that was what was written, but Mr. Bond said that it was a lashiardi something, and that baldanza was a mistake for speranza. His voice sounded as if he was in church. Meanwhile, the boy called to the cadaverous driver for two return tickets. They were handed in without a word. Mr. Bonds covered his face with his hand and again trembled. "'Do you know who that is?' he whispered, when the little window had shut upon them. "'It is the impossible.' "'Well, I don't like him as much as Sir Thomas Brown, though I shouldn't be surprised if he had even more in him.' "'More in him?' he stamped irritably. "'By accident you have made the greatest discovery of the century.' And all you can say is that there is more in this man? Do you remember those vellum books in my library, stamped with red lilies? This, sit still, I bring you stupendous news. This is the man who wrote them. The boy sat quite still. I wonder if we shall see Mrs. Gamp, he asked, after a civil pause. Mrs. Mrs. Gamp and Mrs. Harris. I like Mrs. Harris. I came upon them quite suddenly. Mrs. Gamp's bandboxes have moved over the rainbow so badly all the bottoms have fallen out, and two of the pippins off her bedstead tumbled into the stream. Out there sits the man who wrote my vellum books, thundered Mr. Bonds, and you talk to me of Dickens and of Mrs. Gamp? I know Mrs. Gamp so well, he apologized. I could not help being glad to see her. I recognized her voice. She was telling Mrs. Harris about Mrs. Prigg. Did you spend the whole day in her elevating company? Oh, no, I raced. I met a man who took me out beyond to a race course. You run, and there are dolphins out at sea? You run, and there are dolphins out at sea. Indeed, do you remember the man's name? Achilles? No, he was later. Tom Jones. Mr. Bond sighed heavily. Well, my lad, you have made a miserable mess of it. Think of a cultured person with your opportunities. A cultured person would have known all these characters and known what to have said to each. He would not have wasted his time with a Mrs. Gamp or a Tom Jones. The creations of Homer, of Shakespeare, and of him who drives us now would alone have contented him. He would not have raced. He would have asked intelligent questions. "'But, Mr. Bonds,' said the boy humbly, "'you will be a cultured person. I told him so.' "'True, true, and I beg you not to disgrace me when we arrive. No gossiping, no running. Keep close to my side, and never speak to these immortals unless they speak to you. Yes, and give me the return tickets. You will be losing them.' 
the boy surrendered the tickets but felt a little sore after all he had found the way to this place it was hard first to be disbelieved and then to be lectured meanwhile the rain had stopped and moonlight crept into the omnibus through the cracks in the blinds but how is there to be a rainbow cried the boy you distract me snapped mr bonds i wish to meditate on beauty i wish to goodness i was with a reverent and sympathetic person the lad bit his lip he made a hundred good resolutions he would imitate mr bonds all the visit he would not laugh or run or sing or do any of the vulgar things that must have disgusted his new friends last time he would be very careful to pronounce their names properly and to remember who knew whom achilles did not know tom jones at least so mr bonds said the duchess of malfi was older than mrs gamp at least so mr bonds said he would be self-conscious reticent and prim he would never say he liked any one yet when the wind flew up at a chance touch of his head all these good resolutions went to the winds for the omnibus had reached the summit of a moonlit hill and there was the chasm and there across it stood the old precipices dreaming with their feet in the everlasting river he exclaimed the mountain listen to the new tune in the water look at the campfires in the ravines and mr bonds after a hasty glance retorted water campfires ridiculous rubbish hold your tongue there is nothing at all yet under his eyes a rainbow formed compounded not of sunlight and storm but of moonlight and the spray of the river the three horses put their feet upon it he thought it the finest rainbow he had seen but did not dare to say so since mr bond said that nothing was there he leant out the windows had opened and sang the tune that rose from the sleeping waters the prelude to rheingold said mr bond suddenly who taught you these light motifs he too looked out of the window then he behaved very oddly he gave a choking cry and fell back on to the omnibus floor he writhed and kicked his face was green does the bridge make you dizzy the boy asked dizzy gasped mr bonds i want to go back tell the driver but the driver shook his head we are nearly there said the boy they are asleep shall i call they will be so pleased to see you for i have prepared them mr bonds moaned they moved over the lunar rainbow which ever and ever broke away behind their wheels how still the night was who would be sentry at the gate i am coming he shouted again forgetting the hundred resolutions i am returning i the boy the boy is returning cried a voice to the other voices who repeated the boy is returning i am bringing mr bonds with me silence i should have said mr bonds is bringing me with him profound silence who stands sentry achilles and on the rocky causeway close to the springing of the rainbow bridge he saw a young man who carried a wonderful shield mr bonds it is achilles armed i want to go back said mr bonds the last fragment of the rainbow melted the wheels sang upon the living rock the door of the omnibus burst open out leapt the boy he could not resist and sprang to meet the warrior who stooping suddenly caught him on his shield achilles he cried let me get down for i am ignorant and vulgar and i must wait for that mr bonds of whom i told you yesterday but achilles raised him aloft he crouched on the wonderful shield on heroes and burning cities on vineyards graven in gold on every dear passion every joy on the entire image of the mountain that he had discovered encircled like it with an everlasting stream no no he protested i am not worthy it is mr bonds who must be up here but mr bonds was whimpering 
and Achilles trumpeted and cried, Stand upright upon my shield. Sir, I did not mean to stand. Something made me stand. Sir, why do you delay? Here is only the great Achilles whom you knew. Mr. Bond screamed, I see no one. I see nothing. I want to go back. Then he cried to the driver, Save me. Let me stop in your chariot. I have honored you. I have quoted you. I have bound you in vellum. Take me back to my world. The driver replied, I am the means and not the end. I am the food and not the life. Stand by yourself as that boy has stood. I cannot save you, for poetry is a spirit, and they that would worship it must worship in spirit and in truth. Mr. Bonds, he could not resist, crawled out of the beautiful omnibus. His face appeared, gaping horribly. His hands followed, one gripping the step, the other beating the air. Now his shoulders emerged, his chest, his stomach, with a shriek of, I see London. He fell, fell against the hard, moonlit rock, fell into it as if it were water, fell through it vanished and was seen by the boy no more where have you fallen to mr bonds here is a procession arriving to honor you with music and torches here come the men and women whose names you know the mountain is awake the river is awake over the race course the sea is awaking those dolphins and it is all for you they want you there was a touch of fresh leaves on his forehead Someone had crowned him. Telos. From the Kingston Gazette, Surbiton Times, and Payne's Park Observer. The body of Mr. Septimus Bonds has been found in a shockingly mutilated condition in the vicinity of the Bermondsey Gas Works. The deceased's pockets contained a sovereign purse, a silver cigar case, a bijou pronouncing dictionary, and a couple of omnibus tickets. The unfortunate gentleman had apparently been hurled from a considerable height. Foul play is suspected, and a thorough investigation is pending by the authorities. End of The Celestial Omnibus by E. M. Forster Country Maiden and Prince Charming by Elsifron, Second Century A.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Glossippi to Shapora. I am no longer my own mother, and I cannot bear to wed the one my father has lately promised me in marriage to the young fellow from methemna the pilot's son because i have seen that city youth the wine-bearer since you sent me off to the city when the wine-bearing festival was celebrated for he is beautiful mother beautiful and ever so sweet and has curls crisper than sea moss and smiles more charmingly than the sea at rest and the glances of his dark blue eyes sparkle like the sea when first lighted up by the rays of the sun his whole face oh you would say the graces had left orchomenus and washed clean in the agaphian fountain to dance on his cheeks his lips are painted with roses taken from the bosom of venus and placed on their tips either i must marry him or in imitation of the lesbian sappho i will throw myself not from the lacodian rocks but from the cliffs of parius into the waves shapora to glossippi daughter you are senseless and not in sound mind you need hellbore not indeed the common sort 
but that of antecra of phocus reputed to cure insanity but when you ought to be ashamed of it you strip your face of maiden modesty be calm and come to yourself and recover from this frenzy and banish that wretch from your mind for if your father should learn anything about this story he would throw you into the sea as food for the fishes without hesitation or delay end of country maiden and prince charming by elsifron second century a d evelyn by james joyce this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Evelyn by James Joyce. She sat at the window watching the evening invade the avenue. Her head was leaned against the window curtains, and in her nostrils was the odour of dusty cretonne. She was tired. Few people passed. The man out of the last house passed on his way home. She heard his footsteps clacking along the concrete pavement and afterwards crunching on the cinder path before the new red houses. One time there used to be a field there in which they used to play every evening with other people's children. Then a man from Belfast bought the field and built houses in it, not like their little brown houses but bright brick houses with shining roofs. The children of the avenue used to play together in that field, the Devines, the Waters, the Duns, little Keogh, the Cripple, she and her brothers and sisters. Ernest, however, never played. He was too grown up. Her father used often to hunt them in out of the field with his blackthorn stick, but usually little Keogh used to keep nicks and call out when she saw her father coming. Still, they seemed to have been rather happy then. Her father was not so bad then, and besides, her mother was alive. That was a long time ago. She and her brothers and sisters were all grown up. Her mother was dead. Tizzy Dunn was dead too, and the waters had gone back to England. Everything changes. Now she was going to go away like the others, to leave her home. Home! She looked round the room, reviewing all its familiar objects, which she had dusted once a week for so many years, wondering where on earth all the dust came from. Perhaps she would never see again those familiar objects from which she had never dreamed of being divided. And yet during all those years she had never found out the name of the priest whose yellowing photograph hung on the wall above the broken harmonium beside the coloured print of the promises made to Blessed Margaret Mary Alloke. He had been a school friend of her father. Whenever he showed the photograph to a visitor, her father used to pass it with a casual word. He is in Melbourne now. She had consented to go away, to leave her home. Was that wise? She tried to weigh each side of the question. In her home anyway, she had shelter and food. She had those whom she had known all her life about her. Of course, she had to work hard, both in the house and at business. What would they say of her in the stores when they found out that she had run away with a fellow? Say she was a fool, perhaps? and a place would be filled up by advertisement. Miss Gavin would be glad. She had always had an edge on her, especially whenever there were people listening. Miss Hill, don't you see these ladies are waiting? Look lively, Miss Hill, please. She would not cry many tears at leaving the stores, but in her new home in a distant unknown country it would not be like that. Then she would be married, she, Evelyn, People would treat her with respect then. She would not be treated as her mother had been. Even now, though she was over nineteen, she sometimes felt herself in danger of her father's violence. She knew it was that that had given her the palpitations. When they were growing up, he had never gone for her like he used to go for Harry and Ernest, because she was a girl. But latterly he had begun to threaten her and say what he would do to her only for her dead mother's sake and now she had nobody to protect her. Ernest was dead, and Harry, who was in the church decorating business, was nearly always down somewhere in the country. Besides, the invariable squabble for money on Saturday nights had begun to weary her unspeakably. 
She always gave her entire wages, seven shillings, and Harry always sent up what he could, but the trouble was to get any money from her father. He said she used to squander the money, that she had no head, that he wasn't going to give her his hard-earned money to throw about the streets, and much more, for he was usually fairly bad of a Saturday night. In the end he would give her the money and ask her had she had any intention of buying Sunday's dinner. Then she had to rush out as quickly as she could and do her marketing, holding her black leather purse tightly in her hand as she elbowed her way through the crowds and returning home late under her load of provisions. She had hard work to keep the house together and to see that the two young children who had been left to her charge went to school regularly and got their meals regularly. It was hard work, a hard life, but now that she was about to leave it, she did not find it a wholly undesirable life. She was about to explore another life with Frank. Frank was very kind, manly, open-hearted. She was to go away with him by the night boat to be his wife, and to live with him in Buenos Aires, where he had a home waiting for her. How well she remembered the first time she had seen him. He was lodging in a house on the main road where she used to visit. It seemed a few weeks ago. He was standing at the gate, his peak cap pushed back on his head and his hair tumbled forward over a face of bronze. Then they had come to know each other. He used to meet her outside the stores every evening and see her home. He took her to see the Bohemian girl and she felt elated as she sat in an unaccustomed part of the theatre with him. He was awfully fond of music and sang a little. People knew that they were courting, and when he sang about the lass that loves a sailor, she always felt pleasantly confused. He used to call her Poppins out of fun. First of all, it had been an excitement for her to have a fellow, and then she had begun to like him. He had tales of distant countries. He had started as a deck boy at a pound a month on a ship of the Allen Line going out to Canada. He told her the names of the ships he had been on and the names of the different services. He had sailed through the Straits of Magellan and he told her stories of the terrible Patagonians. He had fallen on his feet in Buenos Aires, he said, and had come over to the old country just for a holiday. Of course, her father had found out the affair and had forbidden her to have anything to say to him. I know these sailor chaps, he said. One day he had quarrelled with Frank, and after that she had to meet her lover secretly. The evening deepened in the avenue. The white of two letters in her lap grew indistinct. One was to Harry, the other was to her father. Ernest had been her favourite, but she liked Harry too. Her father was becoming old lately, she noticed. He would miss her. Sometimes he could be very nice. Not long before, when she had been laid up for a day, he had read her out a ghost story and made toast for her at the fire. Another day, when their mother was alive, they had all gone for a picnic to the hill of Howth. She remembered her father putting on her mother's bonnet to make the children laugh. Her time was running out, but she continued to sit by the window, leaning her head against the window curtain, inhaling the odour of dusty cretonne. Down far in the avenue she could hear a street organ playing. She knew the air. Strange that it should come that very night to remind her of the promise to her mother, her promise to keep the home together as long as she could. She remembered the last night of her mother's illness. She was again in the closed dark room at the other side of the hall, and outside she heard a melancholy air of Italy. The organ player had been ordered to go away and given sixpence. She remembered her father shuttling back into the sick room, saying, "'Damned Italians coming over here!' As she mused, the pitiful vision of her mother's life laid its spell on the very quick of her being, that life of commonplace sacrifices closing in final craziness. She trembled as she heard again her mother's voice saying constantly with foolish insistence, "'Deravon Seron! Deravon Seron!' She stood up in a sudden impulse of terror. Escape! She must escape! Frank would save her. He would give her life, perhaps love too. But she wanted to live. Why should she be unhappy? She had a right to happiness. Frank would take her in his arms, fold her in his arms. He would save her. She stood among the swaying crowd in the station at the north wall. He held her hand, and she knew that he was speaking to her, saying something about the passage over and over again. 
The station was full of soldiers with brown baggages. Through the wide doors of the shed she caught a glimpse of the black mass of the boat lying in beside the quay wall with illuminated portholes. She answered nothing. She felt her cheek pale and cold, and, out of a maze of distress, she prayed to God to direct her, to show her what was her duty. The boat blew a long mournful whistle into the mist. If she went, tomorrow she would be on the sea with Frank, steaming towards Buenos Aires. Their passage had been booked. Could she still draw back after all he had done for her? Her distress awoke a nausea in her body, and she kept moving her lips in silent, fervent prayer. A bell clanged upon her heart. She felt him seize her hand. Come! All the seas in the world tumbled about her heart. He was drawing her into them. He would drown her. She gripped with both hands at the iron railing. Come! No, no, no! It was impossible. Her hands clutched the iron in frenzy. Amid the seas she sent a cry of anguish. Evelyn! Evie! He rushed beyond the barrier and called to her to follow. He was shouted at to go on, but he still called to her. She set her white face to him, passive, like a helpless animal. Her eyes gave him no sign of love, or farewell, or recognition. End of Evelyn by James Joyce Recording by Peter Tomlinson How My Camera Caught a Bank Robber by Elton J. Buckley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lester Drake's detective camera first created the idea of photography in my mind. Before that, I hadn't the slightest inclination toward the art, whatever but when lester purchased his neat little leather-covered box and went around merely pressing a button and getting dozens of pictures by no other means i immediately decided that i too must have a camera lester's was not an expensive one his father had found it in one of the photographic establishments in philadelphia and being of a slightly scientific turn of mind himself had purchased it and brought it home to lester the latter fitted up a corner of the cellar as a dark room and straightway launched himself as an amateur photographer lester's first attempts revealed by the chemical development were surprisingly good and inspired a strong feeling of envy in the breasts of those of his comrades whose fathers were blind to the oft-repeated advantages and delights of amateur picture-taking even more exasperating he straightway became the idol of all the girls at school whose zeal in posing for him was only equalled by the grotesqueness of some of their postures i brooded long and deep over this unpleasant condition of affairs and finally arrived at the conclusion that i would have a camera like lester at any cost lester was kind enough to initiate me into the mysteries of his dark room and to allow me to examine the interior of his camera by ruby light with the knowledge thus gained i resolved to manufacture one myself it wouldn't be as handsome as lester's perhaps i thought but it might do just as good work so i made the attempt using the lenses from an old microscope which i owned but in vain the instrument never reached the second stage of its construction the contrast between Lester's clean, smoothly covered box and what I knew mine would appear, even if I could finally complete it, was too great, and I abandoned it in despair. Then I tried another tack. My father was exceedingly sceptical concerning the desirability of amateur photography, and flatly refused to furnish the necessary funds. It was October then, so i conceived a plan by which i would earn money during the fall by corn husking among the nearby farmers so that when spring opened i would have the price of the coveted camera no one could have worked harder during the weeks through which the season lasted than did i huskers were in demand that fall and i secured work wherever i applied 
it is just possible that if leicester had grown tired of his camera in the meanwhile and had ceased to use it my desire for one might likewise have gone by the board but the snap of his shutter was heard everywhere and at all times and even at night by flashlight in the barns where the frequent huskings were progressing when after a few weeks the farmers ceased to require huskers i struck up a bargain with our grocer whereby i was to spend saturdays running errands for him the money from this helped out wonderfully and according to my expectations when april opened a snug little sum reposed as the fruit of my labours in one corner of my top bureau drawer as soon as the weather moderated slightly lester who now posed as a photographic oracle and myself went to the city one fine morning to buy the camera the neat little leather-covered box was duly inspected and purchased together with the pamphlet of instructions that seemed so enticingly mysterious to my uninformed mind the camera was just like nestor's with the exception of some minor improvements which had been effected since the time when he had purchased his on the way home lester and i drew up a compact whereby i was to have the use of his dark room and chemicals until i felt that i was fairly on my photographic legs then i was to fix up one of my own the camera had been sold loaded with plates ready for use and i lost no time in snapping several views here and there as the fancy seized me lester taught me to develop them and when the most of them came up under the chemicals clear and sharp my delight was great and when i made prints from them and the familiar home scenes and my playmates faces were there plainly before me it seemed to me that the universe could hold nothing more entrancing than amateur photography of course i had failures but they were few compared with the successes one morning in may after i had become thoroughly versed in the art of using the camera and had fitted up a dark room of my own in the attic lester and i sallied out with our cameras for no other purpose than to secure a half dozen snapshots whenever desirable ones might present themselves it was an ideal day for picture-taking rain had fallen the night before and had left the atmosphere clear and brilliant with none of that dim haze which is the camerist's nemesis so often we had strolled along the road perhaps two miles out of the village and had caught three or four very pretty views none had presented themselves however for some time when by a turn of the road we came upon a man drinking from a spring at the side of the road he was but a few feet away and was stooping down with his back toward us let's get him said i in a low tone all right replied lester you do it though i've only got one plate left i had several unexposed plates remaining in my camera so i pointed the box toward the man and pressed the button just at the instant when the shutter must have operated the man heard us and turned his head facing us squarely he evidently understood what we were about for he scowled deeply and walked rapidly away through the woods without however offering to molest us he carried a small black grip with him as the man's retreating figure disappeared through the trees lester and i drew a long breath of relief for we felt like criminals detected in a crime and we were a trifle afraid of the fellow beside we wandered on a little further snapping a few more wayside pictures and then turned toward home and retraced our steps that afternoon lester came over to my father's house to witness the development of the morning's pictures as one by one we put the plates through the developer a majority came out well one or two were a trifle underexposed and there were minor defects in others but on the whole they were very good the star negative of the lot however was that of the stranger whom i had photographed drinking and who had turned his head and caught me in the act that was perfect everything was brilliantly sharp and the shutter had caught the man's full face 
in the negative even so small an object as his eyes stood out beautifully we made a blueprint of this negative and both lester and myself recognized the faithfulness of the likeness notwithstanding the fact that we had seen the man but a moment about the middle of the afternoon my father returned from the neighboring town ten miles away in one of the banks of which he was clerk he seemed to be much excited and perturbed about something my mother noticed it also and immediately inquired as to the cause of his uneasiness the bank was robbed last night he answered and over fifty thousand dollars stolen every cent i had in the world is gone with the rest my mother made an exclamation of dismay and the worst of it is went on my father that we are almost certain who the thief is but we haven't a thing in the world to trace him by not a vestige of a photograph or anything like it which we could give to detectives to guide them in the hunt the man's gone and the money with him and my father sank despondently into a chair meanwhile lester and i stood by listening silently the still wet blueprint in my hand after a minute i went and pressed the print out flat upon the table on which my father's arm was leaning at any other time i would have proudly exhibited it to him and would have been sure of his interest and appreciation but i did not feel like intruding upon his present worriment as i laid the picture face upward upon the table my father turned his head and looked at it indifferently suddenly he pushed me aside and bent over the print so closely that his face almost touched it i recovered my balance with difficulty and stared at him in frightened bewilderment my father had never acted in this manner before and i was almost afraid he had gone mad great scott he exclaimed the very thing then wheeling around he grasped me by the shoulders and wanted to know where i got that picture i was far too dazed by his strange actions to answer a word so lester interposed and told my father in as few words as possible of our morning expedition and of the man whom we had photographed in the act of drinking bless the camera ejaculated my father excitedly that's eli parker the thief and the best likeness of him i ever saw too then he questioned us closely as to the direction the man had taken when discovered and ended by confiscating the print and the negative and rushing out of the house to take the next train back to town lester and i talked about it all the afternoon and felt ourselves quite heroes for having the temerity to stand before a real bank robber fifty prints were immediately struck off from the negative and these were given to detectives who scoured the country in every direction after a two days search those nearest home were successful and found parker in the same woods where lester and i had first surprised him he had sought to evade capture by avoiding railroads and hiding himself until the first excitement of the robbery had passed as the whole amount of stolen funds was discovered in the little black grip which he carried he was convicted of the crime without difficulty and sentenced for a term of fifteen years in state prison the sequel of the incident was the most agreeable and the most astonishing of all one day a month subsequent when parker had been safely housed in the penitentiary my father came home and with a mysterious smile upon his face handed me an envelope upon being opened the discovery was made that howard benton and lester drake were authorized to draw upon the first national bank of c for one hundred dollars apiece in slight recognition of their part in apprehending eli parker the perpetrator of the recent robbery upon that institution i am still an ardent disciple of amateur photography who wouldn't be under such circumstances End of How My Camera Caught a Bank Robber by Elton J. Buckley I Am a Nucleus by Stephen Barr 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan McAdam. When I got home from the office, I was not so much tired as beaten down, but the effect is similar. I let myself into the apartment, which had an absentee wife look, and took a cold shower. The present downtown temperature, according to the radio, was 87 degrees, but according to my Greenwich Village thermometer it was 96. I got dressed and went into the living room, and wished ardently that my wife Molly were here to tell me why the whole place looks so woebegone. What do they do, I asked myself, that I have left undone? I've vacuumed the carpet, I've dusted, and I've straightened the cushions. Ah, the ashtrays! I emptied them, washed them and put them back, but still the place looked wife deserted. It had been a bad day. I'd forgotten to wind the alarm clock, so I'd had to hurry to make a story conference at one of the TV studios I write for. I didn't notice the impending rainstorm and had no umbrella when I reached the sidewalk to find myself confronted with an almost tropical downpour. I would have turned back, but a taxi came up and a woman got out, so I dashed through the rain and got in. Madison and 54th, I said. Right, said the driver, and I heard the starter grind and then go on grinding. After some futile efforts, he turned to me. Sorry, Mac. You'll have to find another cab. Good hunting. If possible, it was raining still harder. I opened the newspaper over my hat and ran for the subway, three blocks. Whizzing traffic held me up at each crossing, and I was soaked when I reached the platform, just in time to miss the local. After an abnormal delay, I got one which exactly missed the express at 14th Street. The same thing happened at both ends of the Crosstown shuttle, but I found the rain had stopped when I got out at 51st and Lexington. As I walked across to Madison Avenue, I passed a big excavation site where they were getting ready to put up a new office building. There was the usual crowd of buffs watching the digging machines and, in particular, a man with a pneumatic drill who was breaking up some hard-packed clay. While I looked, a big lump of it fell away and for an instant I was able to see something that looked like a chunk of dirty glass the size of an old-fashioned hat box. It glittered brilliantly in the sunlight, and then his chattering drill hit it. There was a faint bang, and the thing disintegrated. It knocked him on his back, but he got right up and realized he was not hurt. At the moment of the explosion, if so feeble a thing can be called one, I felt something sting my face and, on touching it, found blood on my hand. I mopped at it with my handkerchief, but, though slight, the bleeding would not stop so I went to a drugstore and bought some pink adhesive which I put on the tiny cut. When I got to the studio, I had found that I had missed the story conference. During the day, by actual count, I heard the phrase, I'm just spitballing, eight times, and another Madison Avenue favorite, the whole ball of wax, twelve times. However, my story had been accepted without change because nobody had noticed my absence from the conference room. There you have what is known as the advertising world, the advertising game, or the advertising racket, depending on which rung of the ladder you achieved. The subway gave a repeat performance going home, and as I got to the apartment house we lived in, the cop on the afternoon beat was standing there talking to the doorman. He said, Hello, Mr. Graham. I guess you must have just missed it at your office building. I looked blank, and he explained, We just heard a little while ago. All six elevators in your building jammed at the same time. Sounds crazy. I guess you missed it. Anything can happen in advertising, I thought. That's right, Danny. I just missed it, I said, and went on in. Psychiatry tells us that some people are accident-prone. I, on the other hand, seemed recently to be coincidence-prone, fluke happy, and except for the alarm clock, I'd had no control over what had been going on. I went into our little kitchen to make a drink and reread the directions Molly had left telling me how to get along by myself until she got back from her mother's in Oyster Bay, a matter of ten days. How to make coffee, how to open a can, whom to call if I took sick and such. My wife used to be a trained nurse, and she is quite convinced that I cannot take a breath without her. She is right, but not for the reason she supposes. I opened the refrigerator to get some ice and saw another notice. When you take out the milk or butter, put it right back, and close the door, too. Intimidated. I took my drink into the living room and sat down in front of the typewriter. As I stared into the novel that was to liberate me from Madison Avenue, I noticed the mistake and picked up a pencil. 
When I put it down, it rolled off the desk and, with my eyes on the manuscript, I groped under the chair for it. Then I looked down. The pencil was standing on its end. There, I thought to myself, is that one chance in a million we hear about, and picked up the pencil. I turned back to my novel and drank some of the highball in hopes of inspiration and surcease from the muggy heat, but nothing came. I went back and read the whole chapter to try and get a forward momentum, but came to a dead stop at the last sentence. Damn the heat. Damn the pencil. Damn Madison Avenue and advertising. My drink was gone and I went back to the kitchen and read Molly's notes again to see if they would be like a letter from her. I noticed one that I had missed, pinned to the door of the dumbwaiter. Garbage picked up at 6.30 a.m., so the idea is to put it here the night before. I love you. What can you do when the girl loves you? I made another drink and went and stared out of the living room at the roof opposite. The sun was out again and a man with a stick was exercising his flock of pigeons. They wheeled in a circle, hoping to be allowed to perch, but were not allowed to. Pigeons fly as a rule in formation and turn simultaneously, so that their wings all catch the sunlight at the same time. I was thinking about this decorative fact when I noticed they were making a turn. They seemed to bunch up together. By some curious chance, they all wanted the same place in the sky to turn in, and several collided and fell. The man was as surprised as I was and went to one of the dazed birds and picked it up. He stood there shaking his head from side to side, stroking its feathers. My speculations about this peculiar aerial traffic accident were interrupted by loud voices in the hallway. Since our building is very well behaved, I was astonished to hear what sounded like an incipient free-for-all, and among the angry voices I recognized that of my neighbor, Nat, a very quiet guy who works on a newspaper and who has never, to my knowledge, given wild parties, particularly in the late afternoon. You can't say a thing like that to me, I heard him shout. I tell you I got that deck this afternoon, and they weren't open till we started to play. Several other loud voices started at the same time. Nobody gets five straight flushes in a row. Yeah, and only when you were dealer. The tone of the argument was beginning to get ugly, and I opened the office door to offer Nat help if he needed it. There were four men confronting him, evidently torn between the desire to make an angry exit and the impulse to stay and beat him up. His face was furiously red, and he looked stunned. Here, he said, holding out a deck of cards. For Pete's sake, look at them yourselves if you think they're marked. The nearest man struck them up from his hand. Okay, Houdini, so they're not marked. All I know is five straight. His voice trailed away. He and the others stared at the scattered cards on the floor. About half were face down, as might be expected, and the rest face up, all red. Someone must have rung, because at that moment the elevator arrived, and the four men, with hat-frightened, incredulous looks, and in silence, got in and were taken down. My friend stood looking at the neatly arranged cards. Judas, he said, and started to pick them up. Will you look at that? My God, what a session. I helped him and said to come in for a drink and tell me all about it, but I had an idea what I would hear. After a while, he calmed down, but he still seemed dazed. Never seen anything equal to it, he said. Wouldn't have believed it. Those guys didn't believe it. Every round normal. Nothing unusual about the hands. Three of a kind, a low straight, that sort of thing. And one guy got queens over tens. Until it gets to my deal. Brother. Straight flush to the king. Every time. And each time, somebody else has four aces. He started to sweat again, so I got up to fix him another drink. There was one quart of club soda left, but when I tried to open it, the top broke and glass chips got into the bottle. I'll have to go down for more soda, I said. I'll come too. I need air. At the delicatessen around the corner, the man gave me three bottles in what must have been a wet bag, because as he handed them to me over the top of the cold meat display, the bottom gave and they fell onto the tile floor. None of them broke, although the fall must have been from at least five feet. Nat was too wound up in his thoughts to notice, and I was getting used to miracles. We left the proprietor with his mouth open and met Danny, the cop, looking in at the door, also with his mouth open. On the sidewalk, a man walking in front of Nat suddenly stooped to tie his shoe, and Nat, to avoid bumping him, stepped off the curb and a taxi swerved to avoid Nat. The street was still wet and the taxi skidded, 
its rear end lightly flipping the front of one of those small foreign cars, which was going rather fast. It turned sideways and, without any side slip, went right up the stoop of a brownstone opposite, coming to rest with its nose inside the front door, which a man opened at the moment. The sight of this threw another driver into a skid, and when he and the taxi had stopped sliding around, they were face to face, arranged crosswise to the street. This gave them exactly no room to move either forward or backward, for the car had brought its back to a hydrant and the taxi to a lamp. Although rather narrow, this is a two-way street, and in no time at all traffic was stacked up from both directions as far as the avenues. Everyone was honking his horn. Danny was furious, more so when he tried to put through a call to his station house from the box opposite. It was out of order. Upstairs, the wind was blowing into the apartment, and I closed the windows, mainly to shut out the tumult and all the shouting. Nat had brightened up considerably. I'll stay for one more drink, and then I'm due at the office, he said. You know, I think this would make an item for the paper, he grinned and nodded towards the pandemonium. When he was gone, I noticed it was getting dark and turned on the desk lamp. Then I saw the curtains. They were all tied in knots, except one. That was tied in three knots. All right, I told myself. It was the wind. But I felt the time had come for me to get expert advice, so I went to the phone to call McGill. McGill is an assistant professor of mathematics at a university uptown and lives near us. He is highly imaginative, but we believe he knows everything. When I picked up the receiver, the line sounded dead and I thought, more trouble. Then I heard a man cough and I said, hello? McGill's voice said, Alec, you must have picked up the receiver just as we were connecting. That's a damn funny coincidence. Not in the least, I said. Come on over here. I've got something for you to work on. Well, as a matter of fact, I was just calling up to ask you and Molly. Molly's away for the week. Can you get over here quick? It's urgent. At once, he said, and hung up. While I waited, I thought I might try getting down a few paragraphs of my novel. Perhaps something would come now. It did, but as I came to a point where I was about to put down the word, a gurgling, I decided it was too reminiscent of Gilbert and Sullivan, and stopped at the letter R. Then I saw I had unaccountably hit all four keys one step to the side of the correct one and tore out the page with my face red. This was absolutely not my day. Well, McGill said, nothing you've told me is impossible or supernatural. Just very, very improbable. In fact, the odds against the poker game alone would lead me to suspect Nat, well as I know him. It's all those other things. He got up and walked over to the window and looked at the hot twilight while I waited. Then he turned around. He had a look of concern. Alec, you're a reasonable guy, so I don't think you'll take offense at what I'm going to say. What you have told me is so impossibly unlikely, and the odds against it so astronomical, that I must take the view that you're either stringing me or you're subject to a delusion. I started to get up and expostulate, but he motioned me back. I know. But don't you see that this is far more likely than... He stopped and shook his head. Then he brightened. I have an idea. Maybe we can have a demonstration. He thought for a tense minute and then snapped his fingers. Have you any change on you? Why, yes, I said. Quite a bit. I reached into my pocket. There must have been nearly two dollars in silver and pennies. Do you think they'll each have the same date, perhaps? Did you accumulate all that change today? No, during the week. He shook his head. In that case, no. Discounting the fact that you could have prearranged it, if my dim provisional theory is right, that would be actually impossible. It would involve time reversal. I'll tell you about it later. No, just throw down the change. Let's see if they all come up heads. I moved away from the carpet and tossed a handful of coins onto the floor. They clattered and bounced, and bounced together, and stacked themselves into a neat pile. I looked at McGill. His eyes narrowed. Without a word, he took a handful of coins from his own pocket and threw them. These coins didn't stack. They just fell into an exactly straight line, the adjacent ones touching. Well, I said, what more do you want? Great Scott, he said and sat down. I suppose you know that there are two great apparently opposite principles governing the universe. Random and design. The sands on the beach are an example of random distribution, 
and life is an example of design. The motions of the particles of a gas are what we call random, but there are so many of them, we treat them statistically and derive the second law of thermodynamics. Quite reliable. It isn't theoretically hard and fast, it's just a matter of extreme probability. Now life, on the other hand, seems not to depend on probability at all. Actually, it goes against it. Or you might say it is certainly not an accidental manifestation. Do you mean, I asked in some confusion, that some form of life is controlling the coins and the other things? He shook his head. No. All I mean is that improbable things usually have improbable explanations. When I see natural law being broken, I don't say to myself, here's a miracle. I revise my version of the book of rules. Something, I don't know what, is going on. And it seems to involve probability, and it seems to center around you. Were you still in that building when the elevator stuck, or near it? I guess I must have been. It happened just after I left. Hmm, you're the center, all right. But why? Center of what? I asked. I feel as though I were the center of an electrical storm. Something has it in for me. McGill grinned. Don't be superstitious, and especially don't be anthropomorphic. Well, if it's just the opposite of random, it's got to be a form of life. On what basis? All we know for certain is that some random motions are being rearranged. A crystal, for example, is not life, but it's a non-random arrangement of particles. Hmm, I wonder. He had a faraway frowning look. I was beginning to feel hungry and the drinks had worn off. Let's go out and eat, I said. There's not a damn thing in the kitchen and I'm not allowed to cook. Only eggs and coffee. We put on our hats and went down to the street. From either end, we could hear wrecking trucks towing away the stalled cars. There were, by this time, a number of harassed cops directing the maneuver, and we heard one of them say to Danny, I don't know what the hell's going on around here. Every goddamn car's got something the matter with it. They can't none of them back out for one reason or another. Never seen anything like it. Near us, two pedestrians were doing a curious little two-step as they tried to pass one another. As soon as one of them moved aside to let the other pass, the other would move to the same side. They both had embarrassed grins on their faces, but before long their grins were replaced by looks of suspicion and determination. All right, smart guy, they both shouted in unison and barged ahead, only to collide. They backed off and threw simultaneous punches which met midair. Then began one of the most remarkable bouts ever witnessed. A fight in which fist hit fist but never anything else, until both champions backed away undefeated, muttering identical excuses and threats. Danny appeared at that moment. His face was dripping. You all right, Mr. Graham? He asked. I don't know what's going on around here, but ever since I came in on this afternoon, things are going crazy. Bartley! He shouted. He could succeed as a hog caller. Bring those dames over here. Three women in a confused wrangle, with their half-open umbrellas intertwined, were brought across the street, which meant climbing over fenders. Bartley, a fine young patrolman, seemed self-conscious. The lady seemed not to be. All right now, Mrs. MacPhillip, one of them said. Leave go of my umbrella and we'll say no more about it. And so now it's Mrs. MacPhillip, is it? said her adversary. The third, a younger one with her back turned to us, her umbrella also caught in the tangle, pulled at it in a tentative way, at which the other two glared at her. She turned her head away and tried to let go, but the handle was caught in her glove. She looked up and I saw it was Molly, my nurse wife. Oh, Alec! She managed to detach herself. Are you all right? Was I all right? Molly, what are you doing here? I was so worried, and when I saw all this, I didn't know what to think. She pointed to the stalled cars. Are you really all right? Of course I'm all right, but why? The Oyster Bay operator said someone kept dialing and dialing Mother's number, and there wasn't anyone on the line. So then she had it traced and it came round from our phone here. I kept calling up, but I only got the busy signal. Oh dear, are you sure you're all right? I put my arm around her and glanced at McGill. He had an inward look. Then I caught Danny's eye. It had a thoughtful, almost suspicious cast to it. Trouble does seem to follow you, Mr. Graham, was all he said. When we got upstairs, I turned to McGill. 
explained to Molly, I said, and incidentally to me. I'm not properly briefed yet. He did so, and when he got to summing up, I had the feeling she was a jump ahead of him. In other words, you think it's something organic? Well, Mr. McGill said, I'm trying to think of anything else it might be. I'm not doing so well, he confessed. But so far as I can see, Molly answered, it's mere probability, and without any overall pattern, not quite. It has a center. Alec is the center. Molly looked at me with a curious expression for a moment. Do you feel all right, darling? She asked me. I nodded brightly. You'll think this is silly of me. She went on to McGill. But why isn't it something like an overactive poltergeist? Pure concept, he said. No genuine evidence. Magnetism? Absolutely not. For one thing, most of the objects affected weren't magnetic. And don't forget magnetism is a force, not a form of energy, and a great deal of energy has been involved. I admit the energy has mainly been supplied by the things themselves, but in a magnetic field, all you'd get would be stored kinetic energy, such as when a piece of iron moves to a magnet or a line of force. Then it would just stay there, like a run-down clock weight. These things do a lot more than that. They go on moving. Why did you mention a crystal before? Why not a life form? Only an analogy, said Gil. A crystal resembles life in that it has a definite shape and exhibits growth. But that's all. I'll agree this. Thing has no discernible shape and motion is involved. But plants don't move and amoebas have no shape. Then a crystal feeds, but it does not convert what it feeds on. It merely rearranges into a non-random pattern. In this case, it's rearranging random motions, and it has a nucleus and seems to be growing, at least in what you might call improbability. Molly frowned. Then what is it? What's it made of? I should say that it was made of motions. There's a similar idea about the atom. Another thing that's like a crystal in that it appears to be forming around a nucleus not of its own material. The way a speck of sand thrown into a supersaturated solution becomes a nucleus of crystallization. Sounds like the pearl in an oyster, Molly said, and gave me an impertinent look. Why? I asked McGill. Did you say the coins couldn't have the same date? I mean apart from the off chance I got them that way. Because I don't think this thing got going before today. And everything that's happened can all be described as improbable motions here and now. The dates were already there and to change them would require a retroactive action. Reversing time. That's out, in my book. That telephone now. The doorbell rang. We were not surprised to find that it was the telephone repairman. He took the set apart and clucked like a hen. I guess you dropped something on the floor, mister, he said with strong disapproval. Certainly not, I said. Is it broken? Not exactly broken, but... He shook his head and took it apart some more. McGill went over and they discussed the problem in undertones. Finally, the man left and Molly called her mother to reassure. McGill tried to explain to me what had happened with the phone. You must have jogged something loose, and then you replaced the receiver in such a way that the contact wasn't quite open. But for Pete's sake, Molly says the calls were going on for a long time. I phoned you only a short time ago and it must have taken her nearly two hours to get here from Oyster Bay. Then you must have done it twice, and the vibrations in the floor, something like that, just happened to cause the right induction impulses. Yes, I know how you feel, he said, seeing my expression. It's beginning to bear down. Molly was through telephoning and suggested going out for dinner. I was so pleased to see her I'd forgotten all about being hungry. I'm in no mood to cook, she said. Let's get away from all this. McGill raised an eyebrow. If all this, as you call it, will let us. In the lobby, we ran into Nat, looking smug in a journalistic way. I've been put on the story. Who could be better? I live here. So far, I don't quite get what's happening. I've been talking to Danny, but he didn't say much. I got the feeling he thinks you're involved in some mystical Hibernian way. Hello, McGill, what's with you? He's got a theory, said Molly. Come and eat with us, and he'll tell you all about it. Since we decided on an air-conditioned restaurant nearby on 6th Avenue, we walked. The jam of cars didn't seem to be any less than before, and we saw Danny again. 
He was talking to a police lieutenant, and when he caught sight of us, he said something that made the lieutenant look at us with interest, particularly at me. If you want your umbrella, Mrs. Graham, Danny said, it's at the station house. What there's left of it, that is. Molly thanked him, and there was a short pause, during which I felt the speculative regard of the lieutenant. I pulled out a packet of cigarettes, which I had opened, as always, by tearing off the top. I happened to have it upside down, and all the cigarettes fell out. Before I could move my foot to obliterate what they had spelled out on the sidewalk, the two cops saw it. The lieutenant gave me a hard look, but said nothing. I quickly kicked the insulting cigarettes into the gutter. When we got to the restaurant, it was crowded but cool, although it didn't stay cool for long. We sat down at a side table near the door and ordered Tom Collins's as we looked at the menu. Sitting at the next table were a fat lady, wearing a very long, brilliant green evening gown, and a dried-up, sour-looking man in a tux. When the waiter returned, they preempted him and began ordering dinner fussily. Cold cuts for the man, and Vicky Soise, lobster salad, and strawberry parfait for the fat lady. I tasted my drink. It was most peculiar. Salt seemed to have been used instead of sugar. I mentioned this, and my companions tried theirs and made faces. The waiter was concerned and apologetic, and took the drinks back to the bar across the room. The bartender looked over at us and tasted one of the drinks. Then he dumped them in his sink with a puzzled expression and made a new batch. After shaking this up, he set out a row of glasses, put ice in them, and began to pour. That is to say, he tilted the shaker over the first one, but nothing came out. He bumped it against the side of the bar and tried again. Still nothing. Then he took off the top and pried into it with his pick, his face pink with exasperation. I had the impression that the shaker had frozen solid. Well, ice is a crystal, I thought to myself. The other bartender gave him a fresh shaker, but the same thing happened, and I saw no more because the customers sitting at the bar crowded around in front of him, offering advice. Our waiter came back, baffled, saying he'd have the drinks in a moment, and went to the kitchen. When he returned, he had Madame's Vicky Soi and some rolls, which he put down, and then went to the bar, where the audience had grown larger. Molly lit a cigarette and said, I suppose this is all part of it, Alec. Incidentally, it seems to be getting warmer in here. It was, and I had the feeling the place was quieter. A background noise had stopped. It dawned on me that I no longer heard the faint hum of the air conditioner over the door, and as I started to say so, I made a gesture towards it. My hand collided with Molly's when she tapped her cigarette over the ashtray, and the cigarette landed in the neighboring Vicky Swa. Hey, what's the idea? snarled the sour-looking man. I'm terribly sorry, I said. It was an accident, I... Throwing cigarettes at people, the fat lady said. I really didn't mean to, I began again, getting up. There must have been a hole in the edge of their tablecloth, which one of my cuff buttons caught in, because as soon as I stepped out from between the closely set tables, I pulled everything, tablecloth, silver, water glasses, ashtrays, and the Vicky Swa a la nicotine, onto the floor. The fat lady surged from the banquet and slapped me meatily. The man licked his thumb and danced as boxers are popularly supposed to do. The owner of the place, a man with thick black eyebrows, hustled towards us with a determined manner. I tried to explain what had happened, but I was 